Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, if you have a Barracuda device, it's time to put it behind a real firewall. We'll blow your minds this week with the horrible state of many popular Barracuda products. Plus, why a long password doesn't necessarily make it a secure password, a big batch of your questions, and a rockin' roundup. All that and a heck of a lot more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Everyone and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 94 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on January 24th, 2013. And this episode's brought to you by GoDaddy.com. I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by the incredible Scale Engine, which you can go check out at ScaleEngine.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is the admin, the teacher, and the tech, Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris. Everybody, thanks for watching. Now, Alan, I immediately noticed there's something missing in the background. This is a very special episode. We should, we should <laughs> yes. celebrate right here. This is the last day from the old house. The yes, last it is. episode. Like, after this episode's done, the move begins. Pretty so, much. And I, I noticed that monitor in the background is, is missing. Well, yeah, all the stuff out of the rack there is, <laughs> is pretty much gone. Uh, and, uh, well, congrats rack, and good luck. The rack will be in the basement office, not in the computer room, so you won't see that on the show anymore. Wow. Send, uh, send your uh, upset emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Well, Although, uh, uh, apparently in a future photo show, they're doing the desk awards again, and I will submit uh, my office space downstairs and the TechSnap studio space, uh, and you'll get to see both. Right on. Okay. Well, we have uh, a great feedback section to get to, some, some great stories in the roundup, but... Uh, the big boy stories in the news. You know what, Alan? I, I'm going to call it. It's going to be a big show. Now, probably the story uh, out of the first uh, block that we're going to get to is the big one of the week. It's from Barracuda. Now, I've worked with Barracuda products for a long time, Alan, and I haven't read the details of the story yet, but man, does the headline have my attention. What's going on? Uh, so Barracuda Networks, like you said, makes a bunch of uh, different appliances and devices, and uh, apparently all, almost all of them, except for a few, contain an SSH backdoor that's not documented anywhere. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So backdoor accounts just built in. Yeah. So uh, if you have a Barracuda spam and virus firewall, a Barracuda web filter, a Barracuda message archiver, which is a thing that keeps all the emails oh, yeah. automatically because some companies are required to do that. So it's just a device. You stick it between your users and your mail server and it keeps all the emails or whatever. Uh, the web application firewall, a link balancer, load balancer, or the SSL VPN product, then those uh, contain backdoors. <laughs> wow. So basically every Barracuda product that I've ever worked with. A lot of these Pretty are Linux-based. Uh, uh, yes, you know. all, all the ones here are Linux-based. Uh, <laughs> and basically it's highly recommended that you update to security definitions 2.0.5. Uh, if you have a support contract, your device probably automatically updates, but you should definitely confirm that it has uh, security definition 2.0.5 uh, because if it doesn't, then it's vulnerable. Uh, so in particular, the devices contain a number of undocumented accounts that have static passwords, including root, which has a password, which is just in the shadow file there, and somebody could grab that shadow file and run it through John the Ripper and get the password, uh, especially considering that that password seems to be the same on all the devices. <laughs> oh, lovely. Not sure about that. Uh, there's a user called Build, which also has UID zero, so it's effectively <laughs> root, yep. uh, although it has a different password. Uh, there's an account called Shutdown, which has a password, and its shell is the shutdown command. So if you log in as that user, it reboots the device. Uh, there's a user called Product, which has a full bash shell. So if you uh, crack that password, you can just log in and get a shell on the device and do whatever you want. Ugh. Uh, there's a CA user, which I think has to do with the certificate authority. I'm not sure. Uh, support and web support users, which you know makes this likely for Barracuda to access your device when you're calling them on the phone. Yeah. Uh, but apparently those have static passwords that have been cracked. And a QA underscore test user. Uh, so in the show notes, I've marked some of them with stars, which are uh, root, build, and QA test. And those are the only ones that they weren't able to crack very quickly using John the Ripper and a short word list. Hmm. So that means that the product account, which is the one that gives you a full shell, has a password that's fairly easily guessed. Uh, so, you know, they just 
got the shadow file off one of these things, cracked it, and uh, they're going to publish that password in about a month after people have had time to uh, update their Barracuda devices. And we'll all find out what that password is, or you could crack it if you happen to have a dump of the shadow file from one of these Barracuda devices. What's incredible is the the different range of services that these these devices cover. Like almost all of them are in some sort of security critical position. Even you know your email archive means all of your emails are on there. Your firewall obviously there's ramifications there. Uh, yeah, or the web filter because that means it may be able to inject content into all web pages. Oh, I was just thinking you know, of if you comp- spying, but yeah. Right, but if you compromise that web filter, you can basically stick one of those Java zero-day exploits into any trusted page, right? Like people may be more willing to accept a warning from Java if it's on a page right. for like their corporation as opposed to uh, on some random page where they're not expecting it. Or, you know, the SSL VPN product. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so with those usernames, you can just log in oh, you know, over the terminal with the S, uh, serial cable or whatever. And, you know, with the password, you could log in as product and have full shell access to the whole system. There are also a few other users that have no password, right? The, the part of the shadow file where the password normally is just has an X or an asterisk so that... Um, it means there's no possible hash that will let that user log in, but they have SSH keys set up. Hmm. So there's a user called Remote, which also has UID 0 and has an SSH key. Uh, so Barracuda has that key and means they, they can log into any device over SSH with their key. Wow. As root. What uh, would they ever, I mean... Would they ever, even in a, because in a QA session, there's, first of all, they could implement something where the QA requester would somehow initiate the connection and then they could be let in. So, first of all, they don't need it just for QA purposes or, 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 well, or it's support. Well, probably support. But yeah, right. I mean, so, I mean, when I say QA, I actually mean support. Uh, I just was saying question and answers. Uh, um, so, that's not a justifiable reason. What would be the justifiable reason? What, what is the rational their, reason? Their rationalization is it's for support and that they need it. But that's ridiculous. I reject that answer. Uh, well, it's uh, there's a, a few more caveats about it, but oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Um, <laughs> well, surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it it has UID zero, so that that account is full root. So a, they're just allowing a root to log in over SSH, which right. you should never do. Uh, so right now, you can log into any of these Barracuda devices as the user root if you know the password or the user remote if you have the SSH key. Uh, there's also another user called Cluster, which doesn't have root access, but is also set up with SSH keys. Uh, and both of those users get a full bash shell when they log in. Uh, once a user has a shell, even if it's the product account, which isn't root, they're then able to access the local MySQL database. Because it's just log in as root at localhost with no password, and you get full administrative access to the database, which allows you to add new users to with administrative privileges to the web interface. Oh my gosh! Uh, the shell can also allow uh, users to enable debugging mode that would allow them to compromise the device in other ways. What strikes me about this, Alan, is not only are there just obvious like this is a really bad reason to, to like have. Uh, there's so many. There's so many best practices they're violating here. Uh, yep. Root login remotely. Uh, these unnecessary accounts having bash shells, so that way they could get local, get on the local box and execute commands. All of these things. Not only are they just security risks in themselves, but like if you're building a secure device, a hardware appliance hardened yes. device, especially when these accounts appear to have the same password across multiple devices. I mean, these are like these are like one oh one best practice violations right here, and these yep. are supposedly hardened devices. These are yep. kindergarten of security best best practices they're violating. Kind of, yeah. Uh, so these Barracuda devices use IP tables, which is a Linux firewall, to restrict access to those SSH sessions. Uh, normally, you can only SSH in from the the local network, like one nine two one six eight or whatever. Uh, however, they have two exceptions for two blocks of IP addresses. Oh. Uh, so that they can log in from their corporate offices or whatever it is. So there's these two ranges of IP addresses that are allowed through the firewall. On, on every Barracuda device? Yes. So that, the, that, so that Barracuda support personnel can SSH into your device from so their office. on my own Barracuda firewall, I can't block Barracuda f- 
cor- corporate from logging in? Well, sorry, no. This is uh, they're only blocking access to SSH. This isn't. This is right, before okay. the firewall part of the device. Uh, but nor- basically, they block SSH in except from the local network and from Barracuda's head office. Okay. Uh, the problem seems to be that they've allowed two entire slash 24s. Uh, so in total, f- over 500 IP addresses they've allowed in. <laughs> and not all of those IP addresses appear to be under the control of Barracuda. Oh, uh, like uh, both, bo- the, the first set of IP addresses is owned by an ISP called Layer42.net, which appears to be where Barracuda has their co-location. I thought you were going to say owned by the, the CIA. <laughs> no. uh, so that's, that's where they have their servers or whatever. And if you look up the... IPs, you see this like Barracuda's website and their forum and a bunch of other stuff. However, the second block appears to belong to uh, XO.net, which is a medium sized backbone provider. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a lot of the IPs in that range don't appear to belong to Barracuda at all. In fact, none of the IPs appear to belong to Barracuda. Uh, they appear as if they might have been in the past but aren't anymore or something. Uh, because the one thing they noticed in the vulnerability announcement was that the date stamp on the f- the firewall rules is 2003. So these two blocks of IP addresses may have been allowed through the firewall since 2003. So they're not even <coughs> pruning this back door that they've put into everything. Right, and it seems that they might not be using that second block of IP addresses anymore. So but, you have these accounts, that several accounts, which have UID 0, therefore root access. They use yeah. the same passwords across all of the devices. They all accept from these... And, they're, and they're very, some of them are easy to crack with just a dictionary. And they, 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 have, they accept incoming SSH connections from a slash 24 that they, don't have con- that they at least partially right. don't have control over. Right. Uh, definitely the second one, it doesn't look like they have any access to anymore. Uh, so an Maybe entire be, slash 24 they don't have access to anymore? Well, there's, there's two slash 24s, and they don't own either of them. One of them, they appear to have control over the whole slash 24 from the ISP, but the second one is full of a bunch of different things. There's like some little IT management firm that just remote manages servers or whatever, kind of like you or I used to do. Uh, there's uh, some like VoIP servers that maybe are fairly easy to break into, but there's also a bunch of like poorly maintained websites. There's one for like, these conference organizers people that doesn't look like it's been like most of their credentials are from like the 90s and they there's another website and there's like copyright 2007 on the bottom and it doesn't look like it's been updated since 2007 <laughs> if that were to say be a wordpress install or something that somebody could compromise yeah probably fairly trivially uh then they would be able to ssh into every barracuda device uh that they happen to find the ip address of how many times do and we log in over SSH as this product user? How many times do we have to, you know, have this happen to us as as customers before this kind of stuff is going to stop? And 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 what's what's kind of alarming really is Barracuda products are not new. These have been around for years. Yeah, we, like we this, just now find out. This has been out since two thousand and three. So uh, why are we just now finding out? Because nobody's just managed pe- to tear one apart and and look at the files that were on it or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I guess the you know a lot of Barracuda devices are just like little little like sealed boxes. Yeah, they're just little sealed boxes around the But somebody took one apart and, and <clears throat> mounted the hard drive and said, "Hey, what's on this?" And it's like, "Oh, look, a password file." And oh, look, all these users that are enabled and run it through John the Ripper. And oh, look, I have all their passwords now. It's creepy. Yeah. But basically, if any one of those IP addresses in that those two ranges were compromised. For example, by a website that hasn't been updated to, since 2007, I could then scan the whole internet on port 22 and just try to log in as product with that password, and gosh, I could potentially compromise a large majority of all the Barracuda devices that are out on the network. And since most Barracudas are internet-facing because the Barracuda is the firewall or the mail server or the spam filter or whatever. Or the load balancer. Yeah, they're, they're usually the thing that's facing the outside and supposed to be protecting everything. Wow. <laughs> Do you yeah. have any Barracuda products? Uh, I don't, but one of our biggest customers does, and we had to go and make sure there's updated uh, earlier today. Yeah, uh, I don't actually currently, but almost, I mean, I mean, I almost always at some point had a cli- at least one client that had them. But yeah, one of our clients has one of these Barracuda load balancers, although I've been trying to get them to throw it away and use, we, we have a PFSense box in front of it, that's mm. blocking SSH to it anyway. Mm-hmm. 
But um, we've been trying to convince them to just get rid of it and let the PFSense box do it all yeah. for a while. Yeah, that's actually usually the approach I do. I've actually found Barracuda stuff to kind of be junk, uh, personally. Yeah, like, uh, it was definitely not able... To, we, all the video servers go around it because uh, it wasn't able to handle more than, like, 100 megabits of traffic. Yeah, and I've used... And them- we had to disable the SSL offloading because it was breaking things because it couldn't keep up and... Yeah, and, there, and you know, for a long time, they had the clunky interface to manage them on the firewalls and... Uh, you know, uh, there's, I mean, IP tables, I really don't have any problem with IP tables, but uh, I also really like PF. Well, I hate IP tables, mostly because, have you seen the syntax? Have you tried to write that? See, that's compared just to, a- yeah, see, that's, Packet Filter, which PFSense uses, is is much more straightforward, and that's what I've... Well, the, the rules look like English. They almost yeah. look like a <laughs> sentence. It makes yeah. a lot more sense. Yeah. It's a lot harder to screw up because you're not r- trying to remember what random flags mean and stuff. <laughs> Wow, Barracuda. Wow. Uh, another thing is a user may be able to spoof having one of those IP addresses. Right? Like you have those, those two slash 24s? Yeah. Well, I could com- statically configure some machines inside the LAN to have those IP addresses. So that when the Barracuda saw the traffic, it would think it was coming from Barracuda's head office, but it's actually coming from inside the LAN. Because inside the LAN, I control the routing, right? So I may be able to, you know, compromise a Barracuda device at a place where I work. Oh, yeah, of course. Or not in the IT department or whatever. I, for a second, I was not following you, but because uh, I'm yeah, chatting. So if, yeah, so if I'm I do follow you. A, a person that's stuck behind a Barracuda web filter. Or let's just say you're us. Let's just say you're going to do <laughs> penetration testing. This could be a yeah. great little exercise. Yeah, you could uh, set up a static routing rule to keep that uh, Barracuda's office traffic inside the network mm-hmm. and then spoof one of those IPs and uh, take over the, all the Barracuda devices <laughs> at wherever you work. Uh, uh, but yeah, so as part of the 205 update, uh, Barracuda has disabled the product user completely and all the other users on that list except for the cluster user, which is set up for SSH keys only. Uh, they're not very specific about it, but it looks like uh, that one's meant for when you have a bunch of Barracudas, you would control the key. Or they but just, or that's how there, they talk, a, right? Yeah, there's a key already set up on these devices, it seems, and I don't know if that's like pre-generated and every Barracuda comes with the same keys already set up, or if it's you know, or maybe like generated you, randomly on the first boot. And maybe so when you enable like, the cluster but, service, it generates it then. But see, then here's the question: is why not if you need these accounts like the cluster account? Why not have it disabled or at least have its shell set to nothing until you turn on the cluster service? Right. But these ones seem to already have a necessity. From, from the an- analysis the researchers did, it seemed that there was already a key set up. Like they listed the, the public key in the vulnerability announcement. Uh. So it'd be interesting to see if that same public key exists on every Barracuda. <laughs> which it appears that it does, but I'm not sure. Right. <laughs> uh, the remote user is still there, which has UID 0. Uh, SSH key only login. Oh, good. And good. Barracuda says we possess that key. So, if someone were to break into Barracuda and steal that key, they would have root on every Barracuda device. Or if you were just a government entity that said we have legal authority, we need you to grant us access to this firewall. Yeah, that too. And uh, the root user is still SSH enabled on all of these devices, and it has just a password that could be crackable. So how do you well, consider- every password is crackable, but it may be crackable in a trivial amount of time. So just, uh, just, just so I have it. So Barracuda boxes still have several remote logging capabilities that give them root access to the device that I don't have implicit control over. Is that, yes. do, I, do I have? Yes. Okay. They're, they're, they're keeping the remote user that yeah. they have full root on, and they're leaving a root user for you, I guess. Uh, but I'm not sure who controls the password for that. And the cluster one. So these According are now some to Barracuda networks. These accounts are critical for customer support and will not be removed. See, now these are just major considerations that a customer is going to have to make before they purchase a Barracuda product. I know myself. I don't think in good conscience I would have ever recommended Barracuda, but no, I, I no. never will recommend Barracuda. Even though I kind of, I, I always wanted to like them since they use Linux. But this yep. is just, this is just like one of these things. It's just inexcusable. Yeah, localhost in the chat room asked, did someone publish the shadow file? Uh, yes, they published a shadow file, but they redacted the hash passwords for some of the users, and they will publish the full one uh, in a few weeks once Barracuda and the customers have had time to update to resolve the vulnerability. So, 
time uh, bomb. It's a time bomb. Yeah. Um, and you have to install that update, right? So, uh, yes. And as part of the, uh, and I think to get the update, you have to have an active subscription with uh-huh. Barracuda. Of course. And if you lapse in your subscription, you have to pay the renewal fee. So if you yeah. want to now get support again so you can get that update, you're going to you're gonna have to pay for your back support that you've missed. Yeah. Uh, and also the update does nothing to address that statically defined whitelist uh, ranges of IPs. Oh, the, the, you mean the huge vulnerability? Well, having SSH exposed with the user product with a static password was the hugest vulnerability. But yes, the, yeah. second, <laughs> yeah. the second part of the vulnerability right. announcement has yes. not been addressed at all. Uh, oh my gosh. Because of that risk, it is recommended that if you have a Barracuda Networks device, you place it behind a real firewall. <laughs> right, put it behind a PFSense box. And block SSH yeah. entirely. Uh, customers that have support contracts can contact Barracuda Networks and get instructions to enable an expert mode, which will allow them to then disable the SSH daemon on their Linux install that's on the device. So they could turn SSH off entirely. Like it just, although, does that just give you shell so you can go in there and turn off the I SSH? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but there's still a chance that it could somehow get turned back on. So if you have one of these, it should probably be behind a firewall blocking port 22. You know, those that SSH fairies, just flip an SSH on and off just at any whim. You never know what's going to happen. Well, no, but, you know, an update could accidentally turn it back on or something, right? Right, right. And uh, especially if you have it set to do automatic updates, then you right. never know. Like, it's, if it's not something you're monitoring for, then you might not notice that it got turned back on, especially since it's not externally exposed unless you're coming from Barracuda's IP addresses. And really, if you think about it, you don't want your firewalls updates to worry about what services and software are running turned on or off. You might as well just flip everything to default so. when you do the update because it's just a firewall. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm just all kinds of upset at Barracuda today. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Are well, you ready for story number two? Yeah, yeah. Well, lay it on me. What's story number two? Barracuda again. <laughs> oh. So Barracuda's network's SSL VPN products uh, contain authentication bypasses, allowing you to access them without a login. Womp, womp, womp. So an unauthenticated user is able to arbitrarily set Java system properties to arbitrary values. <laughs> so when you connect, before you log in, you can say, hey, Java, set this variable to that value. Uh, this allows an attacker to either perform a denial of service attack against the device and disable it for everyone else, or allows them to break the authentication uh, security mechanisms on the device. So by using the above vulnerability, an attacker is able to access the API functionality of the appliance. With that, they are then able to do things like download the entire device configuration and learn about the whole network. Uh. Uh, Dump the SQL database, including the password hashes for the entire device. Uh, so that would be not just control over the device, but the username and password of every VPN user. Reset the passwords for all the super users without logging in. So you just go to the certain URL. It doesn't bother checking if you're logged in or not. It just allows you to set the root password of the device to something else. So you could do that and lock all the administrators out of the device, plus know what the password is as those administrative users and go in and do whatever you want with the SSL VPN device. <laughs> this is This is just... I mean, it's Poss- almost unbelievable. <laughs> it's possible that with some of this, you could also disclose local files on the appliance, which means there's a possibility you could use it to get the secret keys for the SSL cert. Rock and roll. Uh, you can also access certain URLs and just restart and shut down the device entirely. So say after you change all the passwords, you could restart the device or, and cha- so it boots off that new configuration. Uh, or you could just turn the device off so no one can access the VPN anymore. Again, if you install Barracuda Network's security definition 2.0.5, it should resolve these issues. Oh, then you're solid. You don't got any problems. You're solid. So if you have a support contract, you're solid. Otherwise, you're probably screwed. <laughs> um, wow. So uh, let's see how Barracuda's doing in a year, right? You think this is going to hurt their sales? You think they're going <laughs> to... Barricade your Barracuda. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's, was that a title suggestion? Yeah. See, this is why you guys should watch live. If you join us on uh, Thursdays at uh, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 Eastern over jblive.tv, we have a chat room going, and during the show, they get to... Wait, that's Danica. That's Danica. But during the show, they get to suggest uh, titles and things like that. I've, I've tossed a few in the ring, too. Uh, Alan, uh, any other thoughts on that? I've got Danica up on the screen. Should we take a word? Yep. 
All right. Well, uh, this episode of TechSnap is brought to you by GoDaddy.com, longtime supporters of the TechSnap program. And we've got a very, 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 very special offer that is expiring at the end of January. That is our $2.95.com. Yeah, you can get that .com for $2.95 if you use our fancy code TECH295 when you check out TECH295. Now, if you want to get yourself something that's not a .com, Maybe you want to do some renewals or get like jbgame.tv I got for our new Google Plus gaming community. You should go sign up. Uh, then maybe you want to use the 20% off offer. 20%. You just take 20% off. Use the code GO20OFF5. GO20OFF5-er without the ER. And uh, when you're shopping over at GoDaddy.com, you'll save 20%. But really, go use that Tech 295. Just go treat yourself to something you've been wanting to get for a while because that is a deal that they only run for a very, very limited time. $2.95. I've explained how they actually get that on last. I don't, I don't know if you've caught it, but uh, they actually send Danica in for every single dot com that they sell for $2.95. She steals it. She claims she's going to write him a big check later, but she hasn't done it yet. So think about it. Just take advantage of Danica's offer, everyone. Tech $2.95 when you check out at GoDaddy.com. And thank you to GoDaddy for the longtime support of the TechSnap program. All right, Alan. What is the next news story? I'm sure there's more good news, right? Uh, yep. <laughs> All right. Well, this one's, I'm sure, going to be something just, just nothing, nothing like the last ones, right? Nothing bad. Right, uh, nothing. Yeah, this is, uh, this is interesting research. Okay. Uh, All right. Passwords. Uh, All right. It's like the dessert from our meal then. Uh, so just because your password is long does not mean it can't be brute forced or cracked. Uh-oh. Uh, so in this case, a researcher from Carnegie Mellon University has developed a new password cracking tool that considers uh, grammatical correctness to reduce the search space uh, when doing dictionary <laughs> attacks against your password. <laughs> uh, so based on a survey of 1,434 users uh, who were asked to choose passwords of more than 16 characters, 18% of those users voluntarily chose a password that was grammatically correct. Mm. Uh, something like a bigger, better password or longest password ever. And, you know, things that were the... They're choosing multiple words, but when you put them all together, they make sense in English. Uh, rather than choosing words that don't make sense together, like, you know... Uh, Duck hot kind of dog on the, sun, on the sun. Yeah. But on the sun is grammatically correct. Right. So the sun, sun on. The sun on like potatoes. Yeah. Uh, that's still even kind of a little kind of... Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, see, it can be hard uh, for yeah. us to just randomly pick words that don't make any sense. Yeah. It's fun, though. <laughs> Uh, the survey also found that users uh, were using some other structures like postal addresses, URLs, email addresses, anything like that. Mm. Right? When asked to choose long passwords that they are going to have to remember, users usually pick something structured because it's easier to remember and easier to work back to. Yeah. Uh, so, but when you're trying to guess those passwords, the password search space is significantly reduced when you move away from considering random combinations of characters. Right? When you just when any letter could come after any other letter or symbol or number or whatever, and start looking at words, you reduce that space by a lot, right? Because there's only so many valid words. But you reduce that space even more when you start considering, all right, this word, there's only certain words that make sense to come after that word, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like on the sun. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right, because on the, and then it's almost always going to be a noun afterwards, right? Yeah. Or and 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 uh, the is very likely to come after on because right. you know on the and yeah. things like that. Uh, so instead of just considering dictionary words, uh, if you f you further reduce it by considering combinations that are uh, are grammatically correct. Uh, so if a password consists of three words, and you apply these grammar rules to reduce the search space from every possible word to just words that would make sense together. It reduces the space to 96.9% .9 of what it was originally, of mm. every possible word. So that's not that much of a savings, although it can enough to speed it up some. However, if you consider passwords that would consist of five words, then you're reducing the possible combinations from the whole original of just any five random words. When you consider only ones that make sense together, the search space is now only 46.95% of the original size. So you've reduced the search space by more than half just by considering only words that make sense with grammar. If you use eight words, the search space is down to less than 1% of the original size. Hmm. So, Alan, what you're saying 
Is my bad spelling and awful grammar are actually good security practices? Yes. That's good uh, to know. So you want to consider that when you're, uh, you know, we, we keep harping on this XKCD comic, the correct horse battery staple. Right. It's a password. <laughs> uh, you need to make sure you pick words that don't make any sense together. They don't have any implied meaning together. Too bad they took that one because that's a great password. Yeah. Correct horse battery staple. But that's, that's such a great example of words that would never go together. Exactly. Uh, because, you know, a lot of people are using things that make sense grammatically. Uh, like, and some of the examples, that there's a, the full research paper is here, and some of the examples I have in there are like, I have three cats. Yeah. Or I had a goat. Right. <laughs> and things like that. And just because those make sense together, you're, you're not gaining as much complexity as you could be by having a password that's that length. Cheeseburgers are best on Tuesdays. Not good. No good. Right. Exactly. Besides, everyone has their best on Thursdays. <laughs> and uh, they uh, do the work with it, and they uh, also used John the Ripper and had it, you know, things like inserting random numbers and doing the lead speak transpositions and things like that. Uh, but using that, they were able to crack, I think it was about 10% of the long passwords that John the Ripper wasn't able to get in a, in a oh. sufficient period of time. Oh. They were to get, able to get a lot sooner. Look at them. Uh, so anyway, the full paper is there, and it's an interesting read. Yep. I, was show, I showed a couple pages from it while you were talking, and they have a... Yeah, because the one graph uh, is interesting. You can yeah. see the... Like where uh, it kind of drops off? Well, you can see if you're just using characters, it goes up very sharply every time you add an extra character. Mm -hmm. And in words, it's a little less sharp. And you can see that the one with grammar looks fairly close. Mm-hmm. But you have to remember that it's a logarithmic scale. So every little tick up the graph means 10 times harder. So when you actually look at it, you're looking at the difference between like uh, 2 to the power of 145 versus like 2 to the power of 156. Right. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, which is 2 to the power of 11 is 2,048 times harder. Man, password math is yeah, so just, great blow your brain there and, yeah you know, two well, to the power what, 11 off the top of my head and what's funny is uh, it makes a lot of sense to me but i did realize just kind of as you were describing it that uh i you know i have long passwords but they grammatically make sense because like you mentioned that's how it's easier for me, for me to remember them yeah i'm kind of rethinking that a little bit so yeah, yeah. I, I should reread that xkcd comic and then remember the horse battery thing and then come up with something great and i won't tell any of you guys that it's hot dogs and burger related you can tell I'm hungry because I, I got hot dogs and burgers on the brain, I guess. Yep. Any other thoughts on that one? Uh, no. All right, Alan. Well, then with all the news done, that means it's time for the TechSnap Feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to TechSnap at JupiterBroadcasting.com or for popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website or, heck, Starting a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Mr. Jude, are you ready for the first email this week? Sure. All right. Here it comes. It's uh, from Jason. And uh, he's new. He's got some troubles. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, begin here. He says, a longtime Unix admin, but first time emailer to the show. I only found it a few weeks ago, but I'm a big fan and recommend it to all my fellow admins. Well, thank you. Word of mouth is how we grow. Uh, plus, it's nice to hear someone else who's a big fan of FreeBSD and ZFS as I am. Uh, my old FreeBSD 7.1 server runs with ZFS v6. I don't even know what that is. Oh, oh, version 6 of ZFS. Oh, wow. Yep. Holy schmoly. Uh, I also work as an engineer for NetApp for several years, so I can explain ZFS snapshots, the clones, etc., etc., in great detail with clear analogies and images. If you think it'd be helpful, I can put together a blog or a wiki. We have a video that's really great that you should check out. Uh... I also have three submissions for the Hall of Shame. Ah, that's great. Uh, he recently got Verizon Fios. Uh, they fool, the, and uh, so far it's been pretty good. However, uh, they, uh, the card also has a survey. When you uncover their poll strategies, you reverse the fold, which put my login and my password on the outside for anyone to see. From, so this postcard gives out access to his login. Um, well, I can't read all of these because these are supposed to be submitted to the subreddit. But uh, here's the one I wanted to read because this is the worst one. I bought something from 47th and f at Photo, which has been around for decades and should know a few things about security. As soon as my order was complete and I created a profile in their system, they emailed me a welcome email complete with my user ID, and you guessed it, 
password, the same user ID and password I had just created. I emailed them to explain their pathetic security practice and, ins- and inserted uh, and insisted that they delete my account ASAP. They certainly belong in the hall of shame, and I'm telling all of my family and friends and coworkers not to do business with them. As it turns out, many people I've talked to have had the same problem with orders not arriving, the wrong items being shipped, etc., etc. It's kind of a shame, despite their longevity in business, they're still completely clueless and possibly even criminals. Once again, I love the show. Hope to watch it live for the first time this afternoon and may contribute to the chat room, depending on work. Jason. He says, P.S. I use your sponsor leaks when shopping. And I humbly suggest you make them more prominent on the site so more people will use them. Win for you, win for us. Well, we'll see. I don't want to be spammy. But thank you for using right. our links. All right, Alan. So that was interesting. Now, so the way the Hall of Shames work, and we'll have, we have a submission for this week, is they have to be submitted to the subreddit as a, like, as a self-post or as a link, and then they have to receive at least seven votes. And the reason why we pick seven is because that means they also probably will sustain a few down votes as well, and it still then has to reach back up to seven. And then once the community has, con- has a consensus that that is a Hall of Shame contender, it can be submitted to the show. Like Barracuda? Right. That's probably worth submitting. Probably worth submitting. Uh, all right, uh, let's do. Let's read a quick email about penetration testing, Alan. Sure. Uh, AKA pen testing. Dear Alan and Chris, first off, as is customary, I'd like to thank you for the great show and the many others on the JB Network, in particular Unfilter, which is one of the most thought-provoking shows on the net, and certainly keeps a lot of debate going in my house. I have an idea in motion, and would be interested in your thoughts on it. Part-time penetration testers. Now, don't squirm and run away just yet. As you know, pen tests can be costly for a company, and rightly so in most cases, as the value of the product being secured can be high. However, the cost of the test, however, the cost of testing is unrealistic for most small and some medium-sized businesses, as well as personal websites and so on. This creates a huge void that can become filled with company servers and sites that are easy pickings for anybody looking for a way in. Trust me, I work in smaller aero- I work in a smaller aerospace company on precision parts for commercial military aircraft, and let's just say you certainly don't have to be an internet badass like Mr. Allen to pull down designs over the internet. Dot 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 dot. I think he knows something there. Uh, my uh, idea. Right, I can see an idea there. Um, you know, you could start a company, or whatever. I guess. Um, He's, uh, his idea is people co- po- kind of pull together as a community. And yeah, but all- how do you trust a, a group of people that's not a fixed group? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it would have if to have I'm a- authorize people to do penetration testing against my network, I want to know those people and yeah. and probably have chosen to trust them. Where if it's just more of like a crowdsource type mm-hmm. thing, I don't know that none of those people have a hostile intent against my network. Yeah, you know, when I was uh, in the higher falutin money for uh, penetration testing, uh, it was all about bringing out uh, a sales pitch with, you know, here's the resumes of the people who will be doing the test. They have, they have done these things in the past. They have these qualifications. There's a, you know, if, if the penetration testing is serious, there's a big kind of hurdle like you have to jump over. Now, he's talking more like indie stuff for like small websites. But even then, you probably want a non-disclosure agreement so that oh, if yeah. you do breach their network in some way and get access to something that you can't share what you find. I think that group's called Specifically Anonymous. Specifically like documents. It's called so Anonymous on. and they're already out there. <laughs> it's an interesting idea, but I but think... Specifically, like, there's usually some kind of contract specifying that, yeah. you know, yeah. if you break in, you can't sell our aircraft designs <laughs> if you get access yeah. to them or whatever. Yeah. And so there's a lot of legalities and stuff. And so if you wanted to get a group of people together and... Do something be, like that. Yeah. That can work, uh, but there you need like a framework and a system. You know, if you want to start a company where you hire a bunch of people to work smaller amounts of time as contractors or whatever, that's fine. But you need like a non-disclosure agreement with each of those people, and then flow through that to the the customers and so on. You have to have a good way to know that you can trust them because you're giving yes, them certain exactly. control over a client's over a customer's uh, network if they are able to penetrate it. Yeah, and not only that, you, you know, sometimes part of penetration testing is allowing them through the outside firewall just to see what they could do if they could get through. Yeah. Right? And so if you're inviting people in to break stuff, then, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's a certain level of trust there. Mm-hmm. All right, Alan. Next email comes from Dennis, and he's got uh, some first-time ZFS questions. 
After so many mentions of the benefits of ZFS, I thought I might try FreeBSD with ZFS myself. I once tried PCBSD, but I just want the experience of a complete custom FreeBSD install. My system is a Core i7-2600 with 16 gigs of RAM, 60 gigabyte SSD, and 30, I'm sorry, a 300 gigabyte hard drive. I was thinking of doing a full-sized, or, or I'm sorry, I was thinking of doing a full ZFS, but I th- was wondering which of which way of partitioning would be best. On Linux, I just put the root partition onto my SSD and my slash home on my hard drive. But what is the best way to do the Z- what is the best ZFS way to do it? I'm currently not planning on adding any hard drives to my system, and would love the benefits of ZFS with the speed of my SSD. Um, well, thanks yeah, for the there's answer. so many ways you could do that. Um, he could put. Uh, a UFS slash partition on the SSD and then put slash home as UFS on the hard drive. Uh, he could put slash on the SSD with UFS and then put ZFS on the hard drive. So does the drive root still the have to be UFS? Is that not? No. There is a way, uh, there are instructions on the wiki to install FreeBSD with ZFS for everything. Yeah, but it's uh, like- Including, that's the default in PCBSD if you have more than four gigs of RAM. Uh Doing it for the shell is a bit more complicated. If you want to get into that, that's fine. There's instructions on the wiki. It's called root on ZFS for 9.1 or whatever. Okay. But if you download the PCBSD installer, the disk, and then choose to install plain FreeBSD, you can use the PCBSD partitioning system. Oh, that's the way to go. Which will let you do the root on ZFS still, which is definitely easier to do. PCBSD is uh, so cool. They even give that option. Yes. Uh, yeah. When you install, you have the option of plain FreeBSD, True OS, which is regular FreeBSD with some command line PCBSD stuff added, or PCBSD. Uh, and I think there might even be one more option in there somewhere. Anyway, that probably just uh, really shows you how closely PSD or PCBSD well, yeah, follows yeah, mainline it basically FreeBSD. Basically, just a it's their own meta packages on top of FreeBSD. Right? That's it's a great just way to do FreeBSD it. FreeBSD with KDE pre-installed or whatever, and, and a bunch of stuff, and then they have their own package system that bolts on over top. Um, but because you might want to do something overly complex, it might be better to do it all by hand with the uh, shell mode in the regular FreeBSD installer. Because mm. with the ZFS, what you could do is you could partition the, the SSD uh, and say, I think he said the SSD is 80 gigs or something. I forget. Uh, but do about 10 gigs of it as a ZIL, which is your intent log, and that's just... Uh, temporary space where it flushes stuff until it can write it out to the proper hard drive, but mm-hmm. it's considered fully written to disk because it's not volatile, right? That disk isn't going... If if the power goes out, that data is not lost. It's on the SSD. And then the rest of the SSD would be your L2 arc, which is basically when your RAM is full and you still want to cache stuff, save it to the SSD as the L2 arc. Uh, normally for ZIL, I recommend that you do have two of them, like two separate devices, uh, mirrored in case one of them dies. Uh, but that's covered more in the next question. So we'll yeah. deal with that in the next question. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, you could partition the SSD into two chunks. I'd say 10 or 16 gigs or something for the ZIL and the rest for the L2 arc. Uh, so you'd create a ZFS with your one disk and then you would add a log device and a cache device uh, of the two partitions of the SSD. And that would give you the the ZIL will give you the faster write speed and the L2 arc will give you the faster read speed and then your hard drive will do the rest of the work and the RAM will speed it up based on how much mem- memory you have. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, that'll work and be fun. Uh, and you can do snapshots and clones and data sets and all the fun stuff. There you uh, go. The other thing, like with ZFS, you can say, all right, my slash TMP, everything should be uh, compressed and my slash var log, these files should all be gzipped, uh, which is more CPU but more compression. Or you, you know, for slash TMP, maybe you want to use um, LZMA, which is less compression but less CPU usage. Hmm. Uh, so the files will be accessed faster and so on. Uh, and and then yeah, and in the future you could always add uh, more disk space and have it striped. I don't know if you can mirror after the fact or not. I've never tried that. All right. Well, should we go to the uh, removable uh, ZIL uh, question? Sure. All right. This one comes from Joshua. And he says, uh, Hi, Chris and Alan. I believe Alan misspoke last week when he said that the failed SSD, Zill, would cause the loss. Or, I'm sorry. is it, How do you say it? Zed? 
Do you say Z-I-L. Z- Z-I-L? Z-I-L? Americans would say Zill. Though. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. I just, I'm, I'm trying to uh, get in the spirit yes. of things. Thank you. Although, somebody hit, hit me up on Twitter like, don't say it like that. Don't do not do that. Don't give in. Don't give in. <laughs> Anyways. Don't uh, give in. Uh, he said that a failed SSD ZIL would cause the loss of a ZFS array. In ZFS pool number 19, a removable ZIL was introduced, and a failed ZIL would only cause a data loss of the changes still being written to. Usually only a few seconds of activity. So as long as your Z- ZFS pool number is higher than 19, you're fairly safe with a single SSD as a ZIL device. If you're well, on free NAS, depends on your definition of safe, because losing any data is not safe. So that's why you boom. should always have it mirrored. Boom. Uh, but yes, uh, if you have a, a Z pool version of 19 or higher, you can remove a ZIL, and so you won't lose the entire array. But you would still lose some data. And depending on the size of your ZIL, it could be a significant amount of data. Um, mm. And the other thing is, uh, FreeBSD didn't have uh, Z pool 19 until 8.3 and 9.0. Uh, so specifically, if you're using a free NAS from before late October 2012, it only has uh, like Z pool version 8 or something. Oh. It doesn't have the ability to remove a ZIL. So if you're using uh, FreeNAS 8.2 or older, you don't have that option yet. <laughs> and, and since there are a lot of people that are, I didn't want to say right? something that kind of... And I wasn't sure exactly when that happened. or I, I don't have much experience with a failed uh, ZIL device. Uh, Thankfully. Basically, I would never do it unless I had two SSDs. And that's what I would recommend for other people. Especially in a production If you want server. to do it, go ahead. But Maybe like on a desktop, you know, but on a production server. Probably, right. On my yeah. desktop... My ZFS array, or sorry, on my laptop, my ZFS array is just all SSD. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm spoiled by a Amen. 480 gig SSD. <laughs> uh, he also says uh, loves the show and he loves having the confidence that it'll be out every single week. Yep. We haven't missed an episode yet. All right, uh, now the next email comes in from Sergio. And uh, he says that he loves the show, blah, 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 since episode one. He's been watching. He says he even sometimes skips Security Now episodes just so that way he can make sure he listens to TechSnap. Uh, he even has a few uh, not-so-nice things to say about old Steve. <laughs> but here it goes. I need to build an online radio for a guy. I was wondering if you or I, I was wondering if I could donate slash hire you, probably you, Alan, not me, for this service. Uh, this guy, he's probably thinking scale engine, I would guess. This, uh, this guy wants an online radio broadcast 24-7. Uh, he wants one that'll support video, uh, and he wants to be able to do live interviews via Skype, and possibly to be able to broadcast music when he's not like that. Sounds like like what we do. Uh, maybe delegate some DJs to put music on. Wow, that's like like exactly what we do. <laughs> Uh, for now, uh, he does not want to record any shows or reruns or uh, slash downloads. Uh, so, I I was actually thinking first. My first reaction was. Is, Maybe airtime radio because it lets you set up playlists. You can have a bunch of different DJs on different schedules, but it doesn't do video. Right. Uh, if you just want to do audio, there's probably a better choice than Scale Engine uh, because we really only deal with the video side. Like we can do audio only streams, but you're going to get more features from something like Icecast or or Wirecast or uh, not Wirecast, uh, Shoutcast or something that's kind of more geared towards radio like that. Like airtime. Uh, yeah, but our system for doing uh, Flash and HLS streaming would work very well if you want to do video. Uh, and if you're looking to do something like Jupyter Broadcasting, Scale Engine can help you with the making it stream part, but everything up to and including getting your encoder to feed us the stream is is the customer's responsibility. Yeah. So if they need help setting up uh, Wirecast and, and figuring out how to get Skype into the stream and so on, then they have to pay Chris, not me. Yeah, so uh, the uh, the software, so this is how I do it. So I use uh, I use a hosted airtime server, but you can also just download and run airtime on uh, any Linux box that runs from the GNU slash Linux operating system. Uh, but their hosting systems and uh, service is pretty nice and convenient. Uh, then that uh, connects during off hours to uh, a Wirecast system that is streaming the radio stream onto our video stream. So we have radio feeds available for people that want audio only, and then we also have a video feed available that uh, when we don't have something live in studio happening, we at least have content on the radio stream that's also being broadcast on the video stream, and it's usually like uh, other podcasts being recorded or music or um, reruns of these shows. And so uh, I kind of do a sort of a combination of both. 
Uh, and we use Scale Engine for the video end of that, and it works really well. So that might be one way to look into. I, I would say Airtime is a pretty great app for managing uh, you know, the, uh, the playlist and the calendar and the schedule, and it's got a nice, easy-to-use admin interface that you, know, you don't have to worry about whoever your client is learning because it's pretty straightforward. So there you go. Uh, anyways, he says keep up the great work, and uh, he's, uh, we'll see where it goes. Let us know how it turns out, uh, Sergio. We'll be curious to see what, what you get. All right, email, uh, next email is from Henrik. Are you ready? Yep. Now, this one, this one's not so much a question, just like a what the F is going on here. Uh, so mm -hmm. he says, I think I stumbled across something when trying to change my password for uh, AskMet. How do you say that? AskMet? Akismet. Akismet. Uh, I'm using LastPass after hearing about it on the show. So I wanted to change my password, but I couldn't find out where to do this in account settings. So I went to Google. I ended up resetting another user's password by doing the following. I googled change password akismet. Then I clicked on the first link, link Gable, Gable, Google gave me, and he provides the link. He's thinking he was clicking on his own account since he was still logged in and he had the cookie on his computer. But he actually noticed in the URL it contained another user's username. He was then logged in as that user and able to change that user's password. Yeah, that URL, it looks like the one that Akismet normally sends you when you... Re so you go to a page, you enter your email address, and they send you a link, and that link lets you reset your password. The link he found on Google appears to be that. So some guy uh, accidentally or something published His a email page that, showing yeah. the <clears throat> password reset page. And Google indexed and you see, it. It has this big, long... Uh, security token as part of it, right? Yeah. It's like his password is akismet slash account slash reset slash and, and key equals big long random string and login equals Patrick Welker. Uh, so that random string is what allows you to log in. And, but apparently, yeah, he clicked that and it allowed him to type in the new password he wanted. So it seems that this person uh, accidentally published that his email that he didn't I wonder if Akismet could pull down the page for that account or something. Maybe he could Well, you would it. think that after you reset the password once, that they would discontinue the use of that token. Right, That's yeah. You think the token would be time-based, too. That's what my software does. Well, you think the token would have, like, an invalid point, too, right? Where yeah, it, like, like, any password reset system I've ever designed yeah. <laughs> revokes the token once you use it or once you change your password. Or, if, you know, hell, 30 days goes by, maybe. Or, yeah. uh, you know... 30 hours or 30 hard. minutes. You'd have to have an extra database field to track that, and it would probably be a lot of extra work. Uh, whereas mine is just when you change, when the password gets changed, the token gets removed, whether you have one or not. Yeah, that and makes that sense. Way it always, once you use the token to reset your password, you'd have to get it, ask for a fresh one. Uh, hmm. Yeah, that does seem like a I bit of a you. problem with Akismet and a bit of a problem with the guy disclosing an email that was supposed to be private. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even if it's not actually resetting it, which it sounds like it might be, it's still worth that. Uh, sounds like it know. might be. Yeah. Uh, normally, what you would get is some. You would get an email with a link like that. You follow the link, and then they would send you a random password rather than letting you set one. And then you'd have to go back and retype and change that password to another one. Now that's more steps, and I can see why people wouldn't want to do that. But at the same time, this way you're ensuring that only the person that controls the email address is getting the new password. All right, Alan, ready for the next email? This is a little bit of a success story. It comes from Brent Tarr, and uh, he says, Hey, Alan and Chris, Chris and Alan. Just a quick update after watching the EuroBSDCon video on ZFS that we recommended. He says, Congratulations! Made all of the difference. I turned off deduplication with Verify and uh, A time, I'm assuming access time, and now the speeds over gigabit went from 2 to 4 megabytes to 35 to 100 megabytes a second on average, which is pretty yep. sweet. Uh, due duplication was a huge performance hit for my home NAS and uh, on file creation and deletion. Remember, we were like, gosh, that cannot be right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't mention he had deduplication on. He did uh, The not. biggest thing with deduplication <laughs> is, basically with dedu duplication, uh, especially if you're using like the SHA hashes, an SHA hash is, is pretty long, right? That takes up, it, you know, it's like 128 bits of memory um, or more, depending on which version you have. I, or I, yeah, the smallest one is 160 bits. Uh, so, you know, divide that by eight, that's still like 40 bytes, right? Um, so what you're looking at there is for every possible file, it has to make, so basically it has this big list of a hash and what blocks have that hash, right? 
so that when two file or two blocks end up being the same, it doesn't write out that block a second time to the hard drive. It says, "Hey, just reference this existing copy." Yeah. So basically, it has each hash and a list of all the places where that's referenced. So when you go to create a new file, it has to hash the content, check against that entire list and make sure it's not already there. And if it's not, then add it. Right. So every time it's add, uh, you're creating a new file, it has to do all that work. And when you delete something, it has to check that list, see if there's if it removes the file you're deleting uh, reference to it. If there's no references, then it can remove that whole item and so on. So that list gets really big, right? Because you're talking about like a huge number of possible combinations, right? The whole point of a hash is that it's not very likely it's going to have a collision. Uh, now he's using with the with the verify option that would means what ZFS does. If there is a collision, it then does like a byte by byte check to make sure the files aren't that are that they're actually the same before it considers them for deduplication. Wow. Anyway, the deduplication list gets really big. So unless you have a lot of RAM, like something like probably a couple of gigs for every terabyte or something like that, uh, you want that list isn't going to fit in memory. And if it doesn't, it means you're going to have to read from the hard drive every time you want to write to the hard drive. And that's going to get really slow really fast. So you only really want to use deduplication if you have enough memory for it. And how much memory is really going to depend on a lot of factors. There's no easy way to tell. Uh, I found on the mailing list some command that would try to estimate what a current data set would be save if you enable deduplication. Oh, that's interesting. Although on one server running it, it ran out of memory after <laughs> after consuming 20 gigabytes of memory constructing this deduplication list, it crashed because there was no more free memory. <laughs> Which tells me I probably don't want to enable deduplication on that server. You know, it's funny. So the way uh, NTFS has introduced deduplication, now I've really only experimented with the server 2012 version of it. But when it is deduping on a large scale, it it'll do it in two way, two methods. You can there's a way you can set it up so that it'll do it on write, but the issue is when you do it on write, it doesn't do like what ZFS apparently is doing where you just get a steady one or two megabits. You burst 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 and then the file transfer comes to a halt and the system works and it works and it works and then it continues again. Or the, the other thing that Microsoft has done is they do scheduled deduplication. So they let you blast the file system all day long, and then at night, these little agents crawl across the NT, NTFS file system and deduplicate And then at that free point. up space by deduplicating. Yeah. Now, that was something that ZFS was supposed to get, but Oracle bought Sun and shut down ZFS development before that happened. I'm just impressed that we kind of pointed him in the right direction, even though he didn't provide the fact that he had deduplication turned on, because I guarantee you that would have been, we would have yeah, called that. Um, that <laughs> When people complain about performance on the mailing list, the very first thing is like, if you have deduplication, yeah, turn it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, most times, you're actually better off just adding more disks than trying to deal with deduplication. Unless you have a data set that's like a huge amount of duplicate data, most times, it would actually, even though RAM is really cheap, it would cost less money to buy more hard drives than to buy the amount of RAM you're going to need. You know, I could see maybe like if you had a Samba share that was a certain <laughs> data set and it was all like, uh, you know, secretary and office Excel and Word docs and they were like copies of templates and stuff. Maybe for like a small certain types of data, but, but for well, like video it files It depends and stuff. also because the default block size in ZFS is 128 kilobytes. Okay. Well, the chances of an entire 128 kilobytes... Yeah of two of those files being exactly the same yeah. is less likely. Yeah. And if you shrink that block size, that means there's that many more blocks. So you're gonna, your that deduplication list is going to get even bigger. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to need even more RAM. Maybe, so maybe compression is a better turn, way to go. Yeah. Compression is usually a much better way to go. Uh, and compression sometimes can actually uh, give you more speed. Because when you're reading data off the disk, yeah. when it's compressed, you're uncompressing it on the fly, you means you can read faster than the disk can read. Right? You're reading the data compressed at the maximum speed of the disk, and then if you have lots of CPU, you can decompress it, and your read speed is actually the, the full the speed of the decompressed data. Because you're lifting a lot less off the disk. Yeah, so you can max out the I.O. of the disk reading the compressed data, uncompress it, and your output stream is faster than your disk could possibly go. You know, I have not played with compressions for so long on a disk that I never even thought of that. Because back then, CPU, last time I played with it, CPUs yes, were so slow. Exactly. Whereas with ZFS, you know, 
you can and well compression algorithms are a lot better now than they used to be oh, yeah. and with a lot of ram and a lot of cpu like most of these boxes have you could probably get good data i don't play with it much because most of my data is video which is uncompressible yeah, yeah. almost actually almost all of my data is um video or jpegs and so it's already compressed. There's no gain from yeah. compression, right? Yeah. It's lossly compressed. Yeah. So a lossless compression on top isn't going to do anything. Yeah. All right. Uh, are you ready for our Hall of Shame submitter this week? Sure. All right. It's got 13 votes and had to sustain zero down votes. Nobody voted against this one. Match.com. That's right. Hall of Shame submitter this week is Match.com and submitted by Cripsis or uh, wait, Chipus? Chipsis. Chipsis. Chips us ahoy. Uh, when I went to do a password recovery for Match.com, I got an email with my password in plain text. This means Match.com either stores my password as plain text or with reversible encryption. As this is one of the most popular dating sites, I think this is absolutely unacceptable. And to support that, Where's the Boss Key includes a screenshot where he set up a test account and then did a password reset. And there's the email right there with the password in clear text. There's our confirmation, Alan. That, yep. I think right there, qualifies Match.com as a Hall of Shame contender. Welcome, Match.com. And uh, everybody who is in the sound of our, in the range of our voice, yep. go set up a special password just for Match.com. Go <laughs> use LastPass. Go set something special, because if you use that password anywhere else and somebody gets that, and you've got to figure that's a high-target database, right? Yep. That's a huge website. It is. Uh, all right, uh, well, one more little follow-up that was submitted via the subreddit uh, by... Ch- hold on, I put it in here. Submitted by TechSnap with two Ps. Uh, he's, he's a pretty good submitter. Uh, how to secure SSH with two-factor authentication. We've talked a lot about this. I was actually going to make this a last segment, but I just haven't gotten around to it. But it's a how-to article, and just a quick mention, how to use Google Authenticator to enable um, a second-factor a second factor authentication for SSH logins. And this guy yes, uh, is how to do it on a boot. Yeah. Right. I, um, love, I love the Google Authenticator. There's another story I meant to get to, and I keep uh, being too busy. So maybe two episodes from now. Another one on uh, SSH agent pass-through. Uh, oh, okay. And I'll show some cool stuff with that. Yeah. But yeah, this uh, Google Authenticator thing looks interesting. I know a couple of people uh, using this, and uh, it definitely seems like a good thing to do. Yes, sir. Uh, and it actually relates to a story we have later in, uh, in the further roundup. down in this doc. Uh, and there's an image that goes along with it, which we could have kind of combined it for those two. But Ah, look at us not thinking yeah. ahead. Anyway, pay attention during the roundup, and you'll see a graph about the adoption of the Google two-factor authenticator. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, then, I think that's a pretty good tease right there. That concludes the feedback for this week's episode. If you want to email us, you can do so, techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com, or that contact link, hit that, then just select techsnap in the dropdown, pretty easy, or start a thread, then you get other people going in there, and like, what was, you know, what was so great about the Hall of Shames is there was another example where another member in the threads added a screenshot, so we love the uh, subreddit threads, too, and uh, those actually have a little higher visibility than the emails, so you have a little better chance of making it on the show, too. And uh, then you also get usually a little faster response. I mean, I could tell you all the other reasons. I got other reasons if you want me to keep going. But uh, with all of that done, let's move on to the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that didn't quite make it to the top of the show. But we still want to talk about them. Maybe give you some links to follow up on your own after the show. And a lot of these links are supplied by our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Mr. Allen, are you ready for the first story in the roundup? Yes, this first one's mine. Uh, In the longest follow-up ever on TechSnap, (laughs) reaching all the way back to TechSnap episode 3, the UK Information Commissioner's Office has fined Sony 250,000 British pounds, which is about 400,000 US dollars, uh, for the PlayStation Network breach. Uh, Basically, the privacy commissioner found that the attack could have been prevented if the software had been updated on Sony servers and if they had used proper password hashing uh, instead of not. (laughs) (laughs) So basically, they were found negligent in updating their software and implementing proper security practices and as such were fined for breaching uh, their customers' privacy. Not a staggering fine, I guess, but at least it's... The largest fine the ICO has ever given out, but yes, as far as oh, for really? the number of customers affected, it's only a few pennies for each customer. Yeah. See, if you break it down by a customer head, it's not so bad. 
All right, um, this one made some rounds this week, including I got a tweet about it. It's in a couple of different Jupiter Broadcasting subreddits. Yeah, I've seen it came up in the chat room like five times in the last little couple of minutes. So what do you think, Alan? It's called ArchBSD. It's GNU slash Linux Arch with a BSD kernel. ArchBSD. Uh, simple so lightweight distribution. So you the BSD, but you're still doing half of it wrong. I guess so. I guess it's what? It's more about getting the free BSD kernel. I thought a lot of people like the Linux kernel. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm... What am I missing here? What am I not getting? Uh, the FreeBSD kernel has native ZFS. It oh, has okay, okay. better memory management. It has oh, all other snaps, stuff. Snaps. Well, uh, pretty interesting. I'm kind of tempted to play with it just to see where it goes. I think I'm going to talk sure. about it more on last. Um, and- it'll be interesting to see if um, that means it. What it means is it'll be easier to have that as one of the options for a Linux jail under like PCBSD. Hmm. Like right now, the main one is. Uh, Debian because they have the K FreeBSD project. So right, right. rather than having to rely on FreeBSD's Linux kernel emulation, right. the user land processes are compiled in such a way that they're meant uh, to do the the FreeBSD kernel. Uh, so they're better to run on top of FreeBSD. Although uh, somebody's working on a full CentOS in a uh, in a jail. Like it's been done many times before, but PCBSD will actually probably have it as a, a package fairly soon. Now, uh, since <clears throat> CentOS is the one that uh, a lot of commercial products are kind of geared towards, and you know they only support it if you're running it on CentOS. Yeah. So having that CentOS is like startup environment and their package environment and stuff on top of your FreeBSD server would open up a lot of applications to be running on top of FreeBSD, even though their developers only want to make them run on CentOS. Hmm. Cool. Right. Very cool. All right. Uh, so. So yeah. All the but you know. Probably it's only half huge. BSD. Why would you do that when you can have all BSD? <laughs> oh, Alan. Um, well, there's like a running joke in the free BSD chat room about Arch users, but I won't get into that. Okay. <clears throat> all right. I think we might uh, have a few uh, watching, so. <laughs> yeah. So, in the end, uh, it seems interesting. Uh, I don't know if it's all that different from the Debian one or what the major difference is other than Arch is, has its way of doing things that some people like. It's kind of the exact opposite of the BSD way of doing things. And so mixing the two seems like a really odd choice. Maybe it'll be like uh, peanut butter and chocolate. Yeah, but those make sense to put together. Well, they do now in this, retrospect. This, no, no. Somebody this is had like, to do it, though. This is like mixing butter and oranges. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. It just no, doesn't make any sense. no. no. All right, well, I can't claim credit for this uh, saying, but uh, some, some uh, I'm thinking of old uh, Steve Gibson here, some say that maybe we should uh, re, uh, re-acronym Java to stand for just another vulnerability announcement because uh, <laughs> another week, another Java vulnerability, right? Yes, uh, so Security Explorations in Poland announced that they found, now while they're you know, still harping on the fact that in Update 11, Oracle didn't fix one of the two vulnerabilities they claimed to have fixed. Right. They're like, well, rather than harping on that, we'll just disclose that, hey, we found two more uh, complete sandbox bypass exploits. So they've now submitted uh, proof of concept number 51 and 52 to Oracle uh, in their recent rampage against Java version 7. (laughs) Java's just, it's on the ropes, Alan, it's on the ropes. All right. Well, this one's interesting. A lot of the news around the me- you know, uh, Kim.com's new mega service. Yes, I meant to cover that in more in depth, uh, but I ran out of time. And you know, a lot of the information is fairly preliminary, and so we'll see yeah. what happens with that. But-, but it looks like there's a tool out there now called Mega Cracker, which cracks uh, mega passwords uh, and, uh, from, conf- from the confirmation link that they've been sending out. Ah. Uh-huh. So this, there's a tool that's already out there. Uh, it's from Steve Scoobs Thomas, the researcher who, und- who uncovered this weakness has released the program himself, and he's just named it Mega Cracker, and Ars Technica has a write-up on it. Uh, you know, I mean, Mega is a new they, service. I guess right, it's not do they too... talk about what that confirmation link is? Because if it's something like, you know, the MD5 hash of the... Uh, yeah, they include an example in the, uh, in the URL. It's got, like, this crazy long token at the end, so it's like this... It's... Uh, it's basically their their, their domain, and then just ah, this so it's an AES hash of the password, uh, as well as the hex version of the email address, the user's name, and two other elements oh, yeah. that they're not sure about. Yep, and they can just uh, run that through Hashcat, and 
boom, they figure out that... Mega Cracker simply isolates the password hash and provides a platform for cracking it. Yep. Uh, that's why you... Different passwords, different that, that whole thing, yeah. It's, it's, their way of, of passing it is not the right way to do and it. You know, whenever a new service and site launches, I always think about that kind of stuff. It's always, it's always an issue. Yep. R- rookies, right? Yeah. Rookies. Well, They'll yeah, it's it like I've, I've seen this in, in, you know, developers I've worked with, and it's like you, uh, you can't rely on the fact that I don't know what constitutes that hash as a way of protecting it. It's like it needs to contain some unpredictable elements, not just, you know, the username and their email address hashed together as an MD5 as the secure token because right. I know someone's username and email address and hash them together and get right. the secure token. I can figure that out, yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> now, some people say sometimes Google reminds them of an earlier Microsoft, and this uh, announcement, the, uh, this headline I've seen, kind of reminds me of that. I don't know if you remember back in the late 90s, I think it was, or maybe it was early 2000s, Microsoft declared war on the password, and now Google is declaring well, war on so the well, password. Well, Microsoft's idea there was well, everybody use our passport, passport as yeah. single sign-on, yeah. so you only have one <laughs> password. I'm not saying it was a good uh, idea. <laughs> You know, eventually that kind of thing took off with some with you know Google Single Sign On and Facebook Connect and well open. and and we kind of giggle, but I mean, what's powering oh. Windows Eight logins by default now? It's the original Passport service, just been rebranded. So. Right. Anyway, uh, the headline, notwithstanding the, the actual facts, uh, Google's vice president of security is and a few other researchers are publishing a paper on potential ways to replace uh, passwords. Uh, specifically, they're talking about looking at things like the YubiKey or uh, using your cell phone and things like that. Uh, so they say most of these devices will still have like a password or something, like an unlock code, and then it'll be like a secret key or something. Basically, they're working on an extension for Chrome that would allow you to use a YubiKey to log into your Gmail. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, it'll depend on a couple of things, you know, it's Google, so they probably will open this up so that you'd be able to do it in Firefox and Safari and other browsers as well. I hope so, yeah. Uh, but, you know, we just don't want to see this trend towards, you know, Microsoft adopts and something like that, and it can only work in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'd be much better to have open standards for that. But really, if it comes down to you unlock everything with your phone, that just means that your phone is going to get stolen more. Right? Yeah, and or, or when you use it to pay for things. Yeah, and if the only... Thing protecting your phone is like a four or six digit unlock code or a little swipe pattern which people can see by holding your phone up to a light and seeing the fingerprints uh, then that's not really that secure. That's less secure than a password in some cases. Yeah, yeah. The ramifications of all that stuff going on mobile is an interesting concept that we could kick around sometime. Yep. Uh, all right. So this story is interesting. This student was expelled for hacking a Quebec college system. But the good news is, at the end of the day, well, not the end of the day, but at, towards the end of the story, he ends up getting some job offers. Yeah. You know, this one it was interesting because depending on where you got the news story from, the article said that he got expelled for talking about a security exploit or bad programming practices. Yeah. It's like student gets expelled for talking about bad security practices in an application or something like that. Yeah. But what it was, was that he exploited what he found and gained access to stuff he shouldn't have. Oh yeah. So I'll tell you, I haven't read that. Yeah. That's not how it's been. That's why he got expelled is, well, you know, this story says he got expelled for hacking into it. Right. So basically he was, I forget which system it was. Actually, it just says he was expelled for discovering uh, or something like that. Or maybe that was another one I read where it doesn't even really, even specific about what he got access to or what he did. It just says he discovered an exploit and that's why. I mean, Right, uh, and it seems that, you know, in the process of discovering it, he used it. Took advantage. <laughs> uh, Although it doesn't say, you know, he might not have done anything malicious and maybe he shouldn't have been expelled, but some schools have policies that are you is, know, this, is this the Canadian funny. version of the Aaron Swartz story, only with a much better ending? Not really. The timing is kind of it's interesting. It's nothing though. that big, though. Yeah. Um, well, there was a similar thing that actually happened when I was teaching, uh, and it resulted in me having to give a, a lecture about responsible disclosure and how full dis- the difference between full disclosure and you know how all that works in the security industry. But it was a couple of students... Um, discovered an exploit uh, the the college had a voting system and they used they ran a poll to see whether the student fees should be used to uh, offer um, 
like dental coverage and stuff to students while they're enrolled or to build a new gym. And uh, the people against the gym hacked the voting system and <laughs> voted for more students than the their nerds. Uh, yeah, they voted against the gym. Who would have guessed? Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, some students got expelled for that. Yeah, I, I, you know, huh. I've been involved and, in a few of those, too. And the dean came around and talked to everybody, but it ended up, I ended up giving an extra lecture in all of my security classes about, you know, responsible disclosure and full disclosure and how things are supposed to be done. You know, when you find an exploit, you don't exploit it yourself. You either, depending on your personal philosophy, you either go full disclosure, so you write it up and submit it to the full disclosure list like everybody else does. Uh, or better yet, you do responsible disclosure, you write it up, you send it to the company, you give them a reasonable amount of time to respond, and if they don't, then you go public. And if they do, after the patch is out and people have had enough time to update, then you disclose your research. And that's how you know you make a name for yourself as a good security researcher instead of as a hacker. Yes. Now, if you think your internet connection is bad, it could be worse. You could be in Cuba. Yes. Uh, so... <laughs> Cuba basically gets all their internet via satellite. So if you think, you know, if you ping Google or something and you're like, oh, my ping to Google is like 25 milliseconds, that's kind of slow. Uh, or, you know, that's actually pretty fast. But anyway, uh, in Cuba, to get to and from Cuba from anywhere, your ping is usually 600 to 700 milliseconds or more because you have to go up to a satellite and then right. back down. Ugh. Anyway, uh, according to some traffic and BGP analysis done by uh, Renesas, uh, they found that Cuba has activated an undersea fiber optic cable connecting it to Venezuela. Uh, the cable's been under construction since 2007 and was completed uh, in like 2011 or 12, but didn't seem to have been activated. Uh, currently, it seems to be incoming traffic goes over the fiber optic, but outbound is still going over the satellites, huh. which may be a misconfiguration. Or they may be doing it that way on purpose. I'm not sure why. Anyway, it resulted in a drop in the ping time because you're not going both ways via satellite. And uh, eventually it may result in uh, all the traffic going uh, through this fiber optic link. And uh, But in Cuba, not that many people have access to the internet. It's mostly right. and so on. And so it might not be that big of a deal. But Yeah, maybe we'll have some new uh, listeners in Cuba soon. Maybe. You never know. All right, this next story is just a little creepy and probably not anything uh, we didn't see coming, but it's it's kind of funny how in easy, I guess, it is to do it. They're calling it Google Analytics for shopping uh, by using a bunch of low-powered Wi-Fi access points at the ends of the aisles in a store. They will be projecting a Wi-Fi field that's essentially the size of each lane. And then as your smartphone moves between the lanes and attaches to the AP even just to detect it, it will it documents your MAC address, and then the store in real time records approximately where in the aisle you are and which aisle you're in. And they're using this to now build, now these are only in the testing phases, but they have it in some stores as testing to build analytics about how shoppers shop the network and then uh, right. shop the so store. If you, you know, if you stop in front of a certain aisle for a couple of minutes to you know read something or, or right. you know try to decide which of these products, then they know that you know this... Or this aisle, everybody just walks by and doesn't even look, so we need to put up a fancy display or something. But you know where it's going to go. Like, if you spent, like, a lot of time in the candy aisle, because, you know, more and more stores, I don't know about where you're at, but a lot of stores here are starting to put LCD screens up at the checkout with commercials playing. Imagine yep. if they're like, oh, this is this is Mac, this is is Mac, the Mac address, blah, 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 blah. They spend a lot of time in the candy aisle, so let's play candy bar ads while they're at the uh, checkout. Yep. Um, now, we've talked about something similar uh, not that long ago in Calgary in Canada. They set up a system that uses the MAC address off Bluetooth devices to watch traffic and be able uh -huh. to say, all right, this Bluetooth device is moving along the road at this speed, or and it's stopped here or whatever, all right, there's probably a traffic jam there. And so they use it for traffic analysis on highways. Wow, uh, but this I imagine is really similar something. could be done with uh, Wi-Fi and cell phones. So they, they had uh, testing in during Black Friday, this last Black Friday that passed, to, do, to pull down analytics. And the article that we linked to in the show notes uh, provides some of the analytics information they're able to collect during Black Friday, which is the craziest shopping day of the year. So if you're going <laughs> to, I suppose if you're going to pull analytics, that'd be, the, that'd be the time to do it. That's a fascinating, it's crazy. But and then again, I, that, that data is kind of specific to that particular event. You know, it's probably right. not the same pattern people normally use right. when shopping. And I wonder if you could overload it. Probably. All right. So uh, now, speaking of underwater internet, 
There's a cable cut. <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, CMEWE3, which is a submarine fiber optic cable that links Australia, uh, Perth, to Singapore, uh, was damaged sometime last week and is not expected to be repaired until about mid-February. Uh, but traffic is, because these cable operators have agreements with each other that if one of their cables gets cut, they'll shunt traffic over the other. Mm. Uh, so, but it resulted in a lot of uh, problems for Yahoo, especially users that use Yahoo's email service. Oh, and a lot of it got uh, basically, you know, when all the traffic for when Yahoo's agreement for the traffic goes over that one link and it goes down, they had to rewrite around, and so a lot of email ended up uh, being delayed. So, you know, you send an email and people don't get it for half a day. That can mess stuff up a little bit. Yeah. I uh, there's to... a couple of different providers that had issues. Uh, there's more in the story, but uh, everything's back to normal now because the traffic's been routed properly. But uh, the cable won't be repaired until at least a couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, that's, that takes some effort. But so. it takes, yeah, they, you know, they might not even know exactly where the cable's <laughs> cut yet. And, oh, yeah, know, true, right? It's also at the bottom of the ocean, so. Yeah. There you go. All right, Alan. Well, uh, that, I believe, is the entire roundup, right? I didn't miss any links? Nope. Well, I got That's a good record. Okay. All right. Well, then there you go. There's the whole show, everybody. Now, uh, like I mentioned earlier in the show, you can join us live over jblive.tv on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is? 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. And uh, you can also join us at jblive.info, where we have an audio-only version of the stream. And uh, we also have a low bit rate link there if you're on a mobile device and you want to hear us maybe while you're commuting or uh, you have a bandwidth restricted area. And don't forget to join our chat room if you'd like, where you can suggest titles and ask us questions as we go. We're always reading that as the show's going. All right, Alan, well, uh, wow. Next week, we'll see you from the new place. Yep. I'm sure it'll still be in the early stages, but yep. uh, I can't wait. That's going to be episode, yep, right at episode 95. That's kind of awesome, really. Yep. And then we're moving right on to episode 100. It's crazy. So You're Coming up uh, quick. <laughs> also, just a quick plug, don't forget we have our affiliate links over at the bottom of Jupiter Broadcasting. If you would, click there before you shop at Amazon or eBay or if you want to get somebody Netflix or you're shopping at Best Buy, click those first and then we'll get a portion of your shopping session. It doesn't cost anything extra. Or you can grab our browser extensions for Chrome or Firefox and those do it automatically. You don't even have to think about it. And we're adding more sites in there all the time. So there you have it. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning to this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>